2 Corinthians chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, daily beloved, promises are found in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, and 18. Wherefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And we talked about that, Lord Almighty, that's Jehovah, and what's the promise? He be our father, we be his children. And when has God ever broken a promise that a man can break? I can break a promise. And not willingly, may circumstances beyond my control, I break a promise, but God never has. God never will. So we see if we do what God wants us to do, he has a promise for us. This promise, if you separate yourself, you are his children. That's why I stress so short on the separation that people don't want to do. But, hey, I want to say Father in Heaven. And God looked down and said, yes. You don't want to say Father. And as the Old Testament, he'll say, well, why don't you go to the other gods? Why don't you go see the other gods you're worshiping? You spend more time with them. You spend more time with those idols. Let them help you. And you read that in the Old Testament. He told that to Israel a couple times. Let those gods help you. So that's the promise we have of God. We can be his children. He can be our father. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Listen, if we're the child of God the Father, Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, why can't we be clean? Yeah, I know. The flesh steps in. Sin steps in. But we ought not be like that. We ought to be, you know, the worst thing I ever hated growing up as a child is that that time that mom would put me in that little suit and clean me all up. And, you know, the, the pants were, were awful. The shirt and the tie were awful. The dress shoes were awful. And, you know, and I couldn't play or anything like that. Felt so stiff. And we ought to be like that for God. Clean. Press. Proper. But. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We ought to be making ourselves holy more and more, making it to perfection. Revive us. I mean, excuse me, receive us. Now, Paul's speaking to the Corinthian church. Receive us. Take us in. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. No man have we defrauded. No man have we defrauded no man. Paul's ministry has been honest, it has been sincere, it has been trustworthy, it has been without rebuke to everybody and anybody. I speak not this to condemn you, for I, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Paul has a love for the Corinthian church. He has a care for the Corinthian church. This is a church that he started. These are his spiritual children that he's left. I believe he spent three years there in the book of Acts. <coughs> They've had troubles and problems, 1 Corinthians. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. You, excuse me. Paul spoke as it was so. He didn't water it down. He didn't give them flowing milk and honey. He gave them what they needed. Great is my glory of you. Man, they're doing good now. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. The Corinthian church is having tribulation. He is having tribulation. Tribulation is followed all around chapter 6. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's no rest serving God in this world. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side without were fighting. Everybody outside Paul's congregation were fighting him. Within, everybody that was in Paul's congregation were fearing. 
It was so bad they were fighting and they were fearing. And they couldn't rest. It was 24 hours a day. No rest. Somebody had to keep their eye open. Somewhere there were thoughts of what's going to happen tomorrow. Are they going to come again? Nevertheless. And notice how Paul says with fear. Something, I mean, listen, we're human. There are things we're going to fear. What do we do with those fears? You don't rest and relax on them fears and keep them in your life. You just turn them nevertheless to God. It's perfectly proper. You know, you get up in the morning, you think you smell smoke. Well, well, it made the house on fire. That's not a sin. It's like, yeah, it's got to investigate something. You look at something on your arms. Like, oh my. I got to see a doctor about that. What is that? And you say, Lord God, please help me with the guidance. Seek God. Doctor tells you bad news. Yeah, fear. That's going to come in. Well, are you going to be so holy below your doctor said, you know, I've got a, a miserable condition for you that you're in right now. Oh, thank you, doctor. Really? I know the Bible says rejoice evermore, but we're humans. Nevertheless, God. That comforteth those that are cast down. So evidently Paul was cast down. Put down. Comfort us by the coming of Titus. So Titus is a real man. This man named Titus came and met with Paul and comforted him. And there are people out there that when you're involved in the ministry, they will comfort you. They will come to you and they'll give you excitement. They'll give you encouragement. They'll give you a, 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 a refreshing. A keep going. A keep fighting. Keep doing. Don't give up. And they usually show up at the, at the worst time in your ministry. When you're about to give up. And I don't see no results. I don't see anything going on. They're not listening. That one person will come up and say, hey, I like what you're doing. And God will use that in your life to say, hey, hey, I'm with you. Remember, they're supposed to hate you over there. But I'll just send a brother in the Lord. And not only Titus only, but and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. Titus showed up in Corinth to these churches. And they welcomed him, and they blessed him, and they heard him, and they listened to him, and they helped him. And he got a blessing out of the Corinthians. And not only that, wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us, Paul and his group, your earnest desire, your mourning, almost like death, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced. The more. So when Titus came, he refreshed Paul. He said, you know what, Paul? Oh, you got a lot of troubles here. Yeah, I know we do. You know that Corinth church you started? Yes. You know the Corinthians? Yeah. You know they love you. You know they're praying for you. They're in agony of over you. They want to know everything about you. They are near death of mourning and tears and fasting and praying for you. And Paul can look. Paul would be like, you mean there's other people supporting us? There, there's, this is what's getting me by. This is why we got to fifty. Somebody else is praying, and that's what we ought to do by lifting. Imagine this: this carnal church is lifting the apostle Paul up because they love him back, and they're seeking his welfare, and it's a joy to Paul amongst now all this trouble. Hey, you know what? And I know it. You can, make fan, you can make fun of Facebook all you want, preachers. And there's things wrong with it, yeah. Everything, there's something wrong. But when you got dedicated Christians that are on Facebook and say, hey, I'll pray for you, brother, and you never met them. Over the people in your own congregation, in my own church, won't even talk to me. Well, thank God for those people I've never... And you know what? They've been... I put stuff out, and they'll put stuff like, oh, wow, you know, someone's actually reading. Someone's actually for it. We got a guy named Carlos, and I don't know because I hope everything's well with him. He come down, and I, I'd be preaching about hell and all that, and I look over there. He's amen. He's waving his hands. He's clapping his hands. I was like, hey, man, keep going, Stolly. Keep going. And I've had people come down, and I preach hell, and say, oh, we're out of here. Christians. How dare you preach hell? 
That's a discomfort. You got to be helped to other brands. You got to go up and say, hey, you know what? I'm praying for you. In your misery or whatever you've gotten through, I'm praying for you. And you know what? That's a big help. And when God tells you, go up to that person and say, just tell them you're praying. That's it. Just shut up and just say you're praying for them. They may be where Paul is right now. Man, I'm just fearing. I just feel so awful. God, you're not with me. Brother, yeah, I just want to say, you know, we, we prayed for you last night. Our family prayed for you. And you know what that would do for them? God's not against me. I'm I'm okay. I hope I've been that kind of blessing for Christians. That's this carnal church has been that blessing to Paul. Titus has been that blessing to Paul. Now, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians. For though I made you sorry with a letter, 1 Corinthians, epistle, I do not repent. Though I did repent. Do you know in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, man, I am not going to repent. Uh, I'm sorry, I wrote that. For I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry. Though it were but for a season. Uh-oh. Temporary repentance. But it did bring some sorrow. And I spoke about before, Paul wrote that letter hearing from another family, the, 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 the actions, the moral conduct of the church, and Paul sat down and wrote a letter and said, you need to stop this. I love you guys. I want you to get right, but you're carnal, and you need to be told you're doing wrong. And Paul's not even a pastor of those people. He's just an evangelist. He's just a, a missionary. And he sticks out with his pen and paper, and he writes to them wrong. There are pastors today that won't do that with their own congregation. Just brush it off. Paul didn't do that. And he says, I wrote this letter. I do not repent, but I do repent. It's a hard thing when he had to write to him. Can you imagine he had to tell his own converts, you are babies? Maybe that's a little strong. No, it fit. You guys are allowing this to go on. I shouldn't say that. But I do say that. A lot of those things that we read in 1 Corinthians, Paul's like, yes. No. Yes, I better. You guys are so puffed up. That's kind of rude, Paul. But I need to say it. We got wimpy people today in Christianity. They won't stand up. They're afraid to lose money, congregations, buildings, and everything. I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. It's not long. How long is a season? Four months? One, uh, one quarter of the year? Now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry. All right. Oh, just because you you're sorry, I didn't rejoice at that. But that your sorrow, you sorrowed to repent it. I rejoice, you guys. Not only did you get sorry, you repented. Now here we go with salvation. They're saved, but let's look at. You can be sorry and say a prayer, and not be saved. But you can be sorry and repent, and there you go. Now here are born here are born again Bible believing Christians. I don't know Bible they didn't have much. They're Christians, and not only did they get sorry, but they repented. And Paul said, "At their repentance, I rejoice, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing." Okay, now here's two kinds of sorrow. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. All right, you are truly sorry. Let's say whoever offended Paul. And that guy realized, you know what, I offended Paul. 
He didn't go to Paul first. He went to God and said, God, I did something against your servant, Paul. I am sorry that I did that. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that you will help me make that right with Apostle Paul. Lord, will you do that? And then Paul, listen, I've already prayed to God. I prayed about our fellowship together and all that. I know I offended you in this cause. I ask my God has already forgiven me by the blood. I ask that would you please forgive me too. And we can build our strength together as friends in the Lord. That would be repentance. That's true repentance. When you go to, see we sin against God first. Then whoever. And when we can take it to God and say, God, I have sinned. Not done wrong, not erred. I have sinned for the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. That's sorrow. That's repentance. I've been there just recently. I was sorry for what I've done. And I repented and repented over and over. And I told God, I said, God, I know it's under the blood. Lord, I know I'm saved. I am just so disastrous. Just so tormented at what I did against you. Forgive me. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now what is that sorrow? Alright. I'll tell you what that sorrow is. A guy stands up in front of a judge. How do you plead? Well my lawyer told me plead guilty. <laughs> I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'll, I'll never do it again. <laughs> Oh, yes, sir, please. Oh, now give me another chance. I'm so sorry. Please, please. All right. I release you with a pay of $100 fine. And that guy runs out the building and does it completely again. I ran with a Christian like that in jail. He spent one week out of, well, not even a week. It took me a week to come back. And he was right back in the jail. That's not godly sorrow. A child. When he knows what kind of tears will make his mom and dad say, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you can have the cookie now. As long as you be quiet. That's not, that's not godly sorrow. This is sorrow. Get me out of trouble. Get me off what, I'm, what my condition is right now. And then I can go about my life. And who cares what happens? There's no, recomp no recompense. There's no repentance. There's no seeking aid. I've done something wrong to God. I've done something wrong to somebody. i got to do this to make right. No, that's not what it is. Sorrow of the world, the wages of sin is death. You're going to sin. And you're going to keep sinning. And every time you get caught, <laughs> forgive me. So there's only two kinds of sorrows in the Bible. One that is sorrow. As, yeah. Yeah, two kinds of sorrow. One of repentance and salvation, and one of uh, I'm just <laughs> crocodile tears to get over it. For behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, so they've done it right. What carefulness is wrought in you? Careful. We don't want to do it again. Man, we're walking now. We're on alert. Yay, what indignation. Yay, what fear. Oh, God. You can... Godly fear. And the proverb says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What is the knowledge? I sin, and I better be careful I don't do that again. With vehement desire... Yea, what zeal. Yea, what re revenge. That's kind of funny. Revenge. I don't think that's the kind of revenge that I'm going to go out and hurt you. I think that kind of revenge is what would God do to me? Remember the Bible said, it said, vengeance is mine. God said, I will repay. I think that revenge, oh, God. In your holiness and what my sinfulness. In all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. You are sinless. 
perfection under the blood of Jesus Christ by your repentance, by your attitude, by your works, and by your conduct, I can see you guys got it right with God. And this is works and doesn't involve with salvation. This is works to say, hey, you got, Paul said, wow, what you did proved to me you got right with God. And he's telling them, because it just, Titus is saying, hey, you guys, you love you, they love you, Paul. They're praying for you, Paul. And Paul says, well, you know, I get, look at a little something on my conscience about that first letter I wrote you. It was a strong letter. I, I, I don't repent, but I, I repent. I, but because of that letter, you guys got right and you strengthened me today. You guys are no more carnal babies. You've grown. And hey. You're giving me strength. Some Christians, if you sin and got right and truly had things, they still mistreat you. They still want to have you in their society. They still be part of their cliques. And that's wrong. Paul says in this second Corinthians, that guy that had the affair with his father's wife, he said, receive him. He repented. He got right. Call him back into the assembly. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for this cause, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, that had done the wrong. That's the man. For his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in sight of God might appear unto you. That sin that was going on. I didn't write that letter. Just because of that man having an affair with his father's wife. I wrote that in the letter, but that's not the main reason. I wrote all kinds of things in that letter because you, there are all kinds of things you need to know. There are things you need to be rebuked about. There are some things that you need to learn about. There are some things that you needed help and growth about. Therefore, we are comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly, the more joy we for the joy of Titus... Because his spirit was refreshed by you all. You guys have grown so much. Titus was helped by you. Titus was refreshed. He came to you and you gave him lodging. You gave him his needs. You comforted him as an evangelist, as a missionary. Man, he just took a little break. And he has nothing but good things to say about you. And now he's reported it to me. And I'm refreshed by you. I'm given spiritual strength by you guys. Wow, look how much you guys have grown. For if I had boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. <clears throat> if I told Titus anything about those Corinthians, you know, I put a little boasting in there, I'm not ashamed. But as we speak all things to you in truth, no matter what, it's the truth. I'm not, Paul won't, listen, he'll boast about you, but he won't give you false flattery. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, he'll give you the credit. Even so, our boasting, so Paul is boasting without lying. I've heard from, pulp, I heard from pulpits the boasting of, of lies. Which I made before Titus is found in truth. So Titus came back and said, you know, I met with those Corinthians, Paul. Yeah. And they had a girl to, you know, everything you said about them. Yeah. It's true. Matter of fact, you probably didn't even give them enough credit. So when Titus reports back to Paul, there's no lies by Paul. And Titus backs that up. Remarkable. So, from 1 Corinthians to 2 Corinthians, there is much improvement. And his inward affection, this is Titus, is more abundant toward you. Man, it's gotten more. Titus has more of a love now. While as he remembers your, remembers, yeah, remembers the obedience of you all. Obedience. 
That's hard to say from the first Corinthians. <coughs> How with fear and trembling you, uh, with fear and trembling ye received him. Fear and trembling or what are we doing right? I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence. I have con you Would you think Paul would use that word in First Corinthians? I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. You've grown from spiritual babes. You put the sin under the blood, and not only that, man, you you don't want to do it no more. You're refreshing the saints. You still got a little problem with the idolatry, but I bet by time. They get second with well, this this letter we call second credit. I bet you they probably read that and say, you know what? Okay. I bet you it said, unlike the lad to see in church, stop it right now. Get away from those idols. Don't have anything to do with those idols at all. And then our, our family, our friends, our co-workers, anything to do with those idols, stop it right now. And only us Christians gather again in fellowship. I guarantee. And then men, women, realize what Paul wrote us through this letter. All these hard causes, all this tribulation, all this heartache, all these troubles, all this tribulation. Paul says, hey, he's getting it. We're going to get it. Let's go right through. And guess what? These Corinthians from 1 Corinthians that were babes in Christ, carnal. Now we're talking about a good, car we're talking about a good Corinthian church. Now we're going to see them in heaven. We're going to meet these people in glory. And I guarantee that this Corinthian people here by chapter uh, 2 Corinthians, and then when they get this letter and read it, I probably will get righter, more righteous. I guarantee they're going to look to our American Christianity and say, what is wrong with you guys? Yeah, Paul said we were carnal and all that, but we got right. What about you and your church? Now we're in chapter 2 of Corinth. This church now puts the American Baptist. I don't mean American Baptist. There's a, there's a people called American Baptist. But I mean the American Baptist churches in America. And that's now spreading their junk worldwide. Of bounce houses and, and magic and, and anything but the gospel. These Corinthians are going to look at the churches today as a lad to see and say, what's your excuse? You had our letters. Your letters were in your Bible to read and study. We didn't have the Bible. We did not have a complete Bible like you, but we got right. You want to see a revival? Study First and Second Corinthians to see how they got right. You get yourself with godly sorrow, godly repentance, and you will have a revival. But you know, you gotta kick the Christmas trees out. You gotta kick the Easter bunnies out. You gotta stop favoring this pastor over that pastor, and you gotta get away of all the carnalness. That's not gonna happen in America. That's not gonna happen in the world because Bible said, Jesus said. I will stand at the door and knock at the door. The Bible says that the church is going to fall with Jesus outside the church. That's prophecy. You think anything else, then you're going against prophecy and you're saying God's a liar. You stand in that shoes, I won't. 